Please come. Praise the Lord. And to expand on that a little further, I could tell when, and I, listen very precisely to the words that I, I choose here. I, I don't mean any disrespect by it, but I heard when Larry Schoonover was concerned about asking me to speak in the context of everything that was going on. But I also heard the bishop speaking. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Uh, and, and it was, I think actually I was en route. I was driving. I was experiencing the unique sensation of um, going slightly less than the speed limit. It's a very novel experience for me. Um, it happens when I'm towing a trailer um, because physics. But uh, anyway, so yes, I, I did survive as, um, as Brother Heiner referenced. Um, I, uh, I have had the privilege Privilege, no, it is a privilege, um, of ministering in live sound engineering for the district for quite some time. Um, and it's, it's always good to see the, um, the unique move of God that he can do um, when people of, of like precious faith come together. Um, and I, I always feel privileged to, to be there uh, as briefly as I can and get things set and then let somebody else handle it. But it was, it's good to be able to see that and to feel there is a unique and precious anointing that the Lord has for his daughters. And I feel incredibly privileged to have caught just a glimpse of that. So anyway, uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, it's one of the things that I've tried to learn as I prepare to um, flow in the Spirit is that... Um, Sometimes when the Lord, he'll give me something weeks, months in advance, and I'll be as diligent as I can about trying to study for that and wait until the appointed time to share that. Um, and then there are other times when, you know, I'm asked to speak, and it's kind of in the midst of, of the chaos of life and things like this. And I've learned, not always, but I've learned to try to be sensitive and realize that that means that the Lord is going to take care of putting the pieces together. So uh, we can all pray that that is precisely what's about to happen, um, because if I could pick a chapter to read from, a topic to communicate to you, this would not be my choice. Um, this is very much a, a passage of Scripture that you kind of get into, and you just sort of hit the gas and zoom past it, like, you know, just like, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm just moving on. Um, but the Lord won't quite let that happen this time. Uh, so we're going to read this, and we'll go back and look a little bit more. I'm going to read it to you in the, the New King James Version, just to uh, shake things up a little bit. Um, but Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. I should pause here, I'm just going to preface, I have tried as I was preparing this to avoid reading the entire chapter today. I'm not going to succeed. We probably are going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to kind of go quickly through some parts. If you feel like you want to go back and study those later on, that's great, um, but it's not just me trying to prove how much coffee I've had this morning. I promise to slow down at some point. Um, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. 
And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And verse 16, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as servants and harmless as doves. Now, before we continue... The start of this chapter seems pretty familiar, um, seems pretty specific. Jesus is um, empowering, really, his disciples, first with his calling, right, that he has called them, he has chosen them. That's the first um, thing that he gave them was his specific calling. And also in the passage, he gave them specific direction as to who they should minister to. And, and that also was part of what Jesus was giving them, was that specific direction. But then also he gave them power, and that power impacted on the spirit world. And there was a, a manifestation of the presence of God, and it brought a response in the spirit world that was evident in the natural world. This was to his 12 disciples. This is not the only time that he commissioned a group of individuals, sent them out, gave them power, and they came back reporting the success of that and the outcome of that. And so I'm reading this, and of course, when we read in the book of Acts, then there's this continuing at an even grander scale. So I can relate to that, and I'm excited about that, and I'm ready to begin to see that manifest. And he continues on down, uh, as we were reading, and he talks, giving them some instruction about how to relate to the cities that he's going into. And we start to get a little bit, a little bit of perspective here that apparently there's going to be some people that receive them, but there's also going to be some people who do not receive them. And he's giving them some instructions, just as he did at the outset, as to how they should handle that. And it gets pretty serious when he starts drawing comparisons that the cities that do reject them, it's going to be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Oh, that's, that's pretty serious. You do some studying, you find out Sodom and Gomorrah were wiped out with fire and brimstone. But apparently, whatever happens to the cities that reject the word of God that is being delivered by these people, whatever is in store for those cities is going to be even worse. That tells me that this is really serious. It tells me that when he sends people out into an area and they speak those words and they share the word of God and, critically, there is an evidence of the power of God flowing, there are miracles, that there's some accountability that has to happen for those people who are receiving this. And that judgment, that accountability, that consequence, all of that negativity, all of that stuff, he's going to handle all of that at some point. For us, well, if you look in here, it's pretty simple. You speak the word, you do the miracles, you see who receives it, and then at some point, then they move on, and there are some that receive and some that do not. And he gets down into verse 16, I send you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Wow, that's pretty intense. Those wolves are hungry. They got sharp teeth. They eat sheep. And that's that this is being in a state of vulnerability. It's a state of concern, right? But you notice the, the contrast here between the power that he gave them over the spirit realm and the demonstration of that power spiritually, and then really a, a more passive approach when it came to working with people and in their collaboration with people. Now, he did say, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So they're not naive about this. They're not being reckless about it, right? It's, it's like when I make sure, as I did this morning, to pack both my sunglasses as well as my umbrella, right? Anybody watching online, it was quite drippy this morning. Um, but, you know, I, I was hopeful. I want to see the sun. I'm going to bring my sunglasses, but I'm also going to pack an umbrella. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Slight analogy there. But 
you see there's, there's this contrast here, right? And so that's the first thing that I, I really need to underscore to us, is that when we interact with other people and when we, when we try and be sensitive to the direction of the Lord to understand when a se- what, what, the, what the purpose is of us being in a specific area and how long we are to be there and at what point that, t- that season is supposed to end. We don't want to make that, any of that determination with our minds or with our hearts. We want to make it with our spirits, all right? That's the first thing we've got to do is we've got to perceive spiritually what it is that the Lord is doing in here. Now, if you're looking at this and you're like, okay, that's a little intense, but I think I got it. Well, skip down to verse 34, and we'll see if you're still with me. Um, Because this is the part where I started reading, and I'm like, oh, Lord, really? We're reading that? Matthew 10 and verse 34, do not think, this is Jesus speaking, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. It gets worse. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, that took a turn. That, that's, that's a little intense. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, okay, I don't really like conflict. I like to resolve issues, so if conflict is the passage necessary to resolve them, fine. But I know some people that will just let, let issues just go forever, right, as long, if that's what it takes to avoid conflict. And I respect that. That's okay. All right, we're all different. Um, and, uh, and so this idea of uh, that somehow our walk with God could bring conflict, that our walk with God could bring confrontation, um, that our, our experience in God... Remember, this chapter started out with him sending them out and doing all this incredible stuff, but now we've arrived at this point here where it's starting to... Well, it's starting to impact their families. It's starting to, um, close relations are starting to be strained as a result of this. This is, this is intense. And even just back in verse 34, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's, that's hard. And one of the things that I realized as I was reading through this is there is a difference between conflict and division, right? Think about that for a moment. There's a difference between conflict and division. And if you look closely at what's happening here, this is about bringing division. It's not necessarily about conflict. In fact, if you're in a situation, you go back up there and and you look and And what was happening is there were some cities that were accepting them, and there were some cities that were not, and his direction to them was not not have a conflict. It was not get into an argument. It was not get into a debate. It was, with spiritual sensitivity, at the right time, separate. And there would become a division that was there. So certainly, again, at the opening of the chapter, spiritually, there can be some conflict. And that's a whole other topic, but it's a critical and important part of this, is that what the Lord can lead us into in intercessory prayer and in under the direction of the Lord can be to absolutely confront some things spiritually. But our interaction with people, it's different. But it is still can be divisive. Let me read you in Luke chapter 12 and verse 49, Luke's account of this one. Uh, Luke 12 and 49, I came to send fire on the earth. This is Jesus speaking again. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. So this is Luke's account of the same words, very likely the same teaching that Matthew wrote about. Matthew spoke of it as a sword 
Interestingly, that word, um, I, I didn't do a complete study on all of the different places, but the ways in which the word sword is translated, um, but certainly in, in this place um, and in several other verses we're very familiar with about the sword, the specific word is, is really describing a large knife, more of like a, a dagger, maybe a small sword. Um, this isn't a, a huge like broadsword or a javelin. There's actually a different word about that. Um, but this is something that's a little bit more small scale. Um, it was the same word, incidentally, that uh, was used to describe uh, Peter cutting off the high priest's ear with a sword. Yeah, that was a knife. Um, which, as I was thinking about that, like, how does that actually happen? I don't know, just visually, like, how, does, how do you get to that point where you just, like, uh, anyway, um, good, my good brother Peter, I'll study him at some point in there. But the small knife, that's really what this is, is talking about. And so for Luke to be able to communicate this and to use the word here of division, which is actually a different Greek word there, um, helps us understand spiritually that this is... This is not about a conflict. It's not about a, certainly there's a spiritual battle here, but our interaction with people um, can bring division. And here's the thing with division. Uh, it, you end up with some people who just really don't like you and really disagree with you. But you also got some, some people that are listening. You see, when you think of this purely in terms of conflict, it's like, well, it's just me versus them, and I'm up here, and I'm just arguing, right? And a lot of times, we can kind of feel that, especially if we are in, a, in an environment that maybe isn't receptive. We don't think that environment, anyway, is receptive to the Spirit of God, to the things of God, and we can feel like it's just us versus them, that it's just here and we're alone, but that's not really the case. That's not the scenario that's unfolding here, because what's going to happen is, is that if we begin to speak truth, if we begin to allow the Spirit of God to be in operation wherever it is He sends us, and these things begin to manifest, and there becomes a response in the spirit world, which then might manifest as conflict or anger or whatever in the physical world, when this, all of this starts to go down, um, we're going to have to make some decisions and we're going to have to we're going to have to make some hard decisions, at least hard for our, our humanity, certainly, um, about whether or not we're willing to allow division to come, even if that results in some separation. And and that's not going to be easy necessarily at all, um, but it's something that is critical. If those who want to be saved, if those who want to hear the truth, if those that want to, want to receive of the Spirit of God, they, there, there needs to come a division. There needs to become a separation. There needs to be, yes, there is truth here, and I'm not necessarily going to be in conflict with, what's, with what those folks over there are doing, but I am going to, I'm going to declare that here is truth. So that way, those that are seeking truth, those that are looking for an authentic relationship with God, those that are looking to experience the miraculous, those who need to be saved know where to find redemption, because it has been clearly separated, clearly delineated, and because we are willing to allow that process to happen. There is, by way of contrast, there is a story that the Lord reminded me of as I was studying this, um, where this didn't necessarily go, I believe, as, as what should have happened. In John um, chapter 7 and verse 45 through 53, the context here, you can read back in the whole chapter, uh, the, uh, there's this sort of cat and mouse game, if you will, of, of people, of them going back and forth trying to arrest Jesus and finding something to accuse him about. And because the time hadn't come yet for him to submit to that process, then they just couldn't, they just couldn't manage to get a hold of him. And in this particular example, um, the, the, the rulers, the chief priests, Pharisees, they sent some people out that they had some authority to over and told them, go arrest Jesus, go get him. 
And so here we are in John chapter 7, verse 45. Then the officers, these are the ones they sent out, came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Let's pause for a moment there. These are, they're, they're not necessarily the religious leaders, they may be part of their staff. They went out and they found themselves in contact with Jesus and they witnessed the miracles and they witnessed the, the, the demons being driven out. They witnessed the, the power and the authority of his teaching and they heard the word of God and they, they just couldn't bring themselves to, to act against him. And, and so they simply came back and they said, listen, nobody's ever spoke like this man. In verse 47, then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. It's an interesting phrase in there. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? You know, you got to be careful where you decide to draw your conclusions from right? You, you got to be careful which group you decide to follow. You got to be careful following the majority or the loud minority. You have to be careful what you allow to influence, and you, you've got to avoid this. There's sort of this uh, circular reasoning that really sets in here, where they're like, well, we are not believing him, so why are you? And it's, it become, they're like, well, we're not believing him because none of the rest of us are believing him kind of a thing, right? It's, it's like, you just start going in a circle on this, right? And they're, they're telling them their answer, they're not, they're not responding about the miracles. They're not responding to his word. They're not responding about his doctrine because those things are unassailable. I said those things are unassailable. They, they can't be argued with. The manifestation of the works, the healings that Jesus was doing could not be argued with. And his teaching, it said, was with authority and with power. And so that couldn't be argued with. And so they were simply left to just fall back on their own traditions, their own sort of group thinking, if you will. And, and, and that was their basis here. And they're telling them, I don't know why you guys are following them. None of us have. And in verse 50, Nicodemus, and in parentheses, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does not our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Nicodemus didn't want conflict, apparently. Nicodemus punted on the issue, as we would say. He demurred. Whatever you want, whatever word you want to describe, he wiggled out from underneath it. There, Nicodemus was, the Bible says, a, a, a chief priest. He was a ruler of the Pharisees. This wasn't just some casual guy. And when you read in earlier in Scripture um, about his encounter with Jesus, he came to Jesus at night he came to Jesus under cover of darkness. He came to Jesus in a way that, that wouldn't draw attention to, to him and in his position. Um, and what he heard from Jesus was a powerful revelation. You must be born of water and of the Spirit, Jesus told him. And he talked to him about the process of being born again. And there is there's such a powerful doctrine that is communicated directly from Jesus to this man, Nicodemus. You know, the, I'm sure that the confrontations the, that the, they were trying, the arguments they were trying to have with Jesus, that's what made the news, Bishop. But the, those individual personal evangelism conversations, those didn't make the news, right? But they were still happening. They were still happening. And I think that that pattern will continue to play out, even if there are some people who get really uptight about some of the things that are being said or done, there will still be individuals who come and, and are saying, okay, I just, I want to know a little bit more. I want to understand a little bit more. And so that part that Nicodemus did, I, I don't have anything against him. I think what he did there, I, he's under a lot of pressure. He's, in, he's just trying to figure this out, right? So I don't necessarily have any, um, any qualms with that original conversation. But I got some issues in the context of what we read in Matthew 10. I got a little bit of issues with the way that he dealt with this situation. 
Because here was some individuals, some officers of the court, that had heard Jesus speak, they'd seen the miracles, and they were just looking for somebody to tell them that that Jesus was at least someone they should continue following. They were just looking for somebody. And the argument here was, well, none of the religious leaders have believed him, so why are you? And they probably accepted them. They probably bought into that. But the fact of the matter was, there was one of the religious leaders, and he was there in their midst. His name was Nicodemus. He had heard from Jesus, and yet, and yet, he remained silent. Nicodemus is referenced again in Scripture toward the end of Jesus' life. He brought, um, I think the, the modern reference is nearly 100 pounds of embalming fluid um, to, to the body of Jesus. And so he obviously was following the situation. And he was willing, he loved Jesus apparently, and was willing to be involved financially even in contributing there. But when it came to this situation that undoubtedly would have brought division, undoubtedly would have brought separation, undoubtedly would have challenged the position that he was in, he chose not to engage there. He chose not to elect, he he, he chose to to, to withhold his witness, really, and in a context that could have made likely a difference in, in the lives of a number of people. How many people would have believed if a chief priest, if somebody in a position of authority and power would have stood up and said, I believe Jesus. I stand for Jesus. Would there still have been some people angry? Oh, absolutely. Would there have been still some people trying to pick a fight with him? Sure. Would he have possibly lost his social standing? Yeah. Maybe even his livelihood? Yeah, possibly. But there might have been some folks saved as a result of it. And I I think that what the Lord wants to impart to us today, um, again, just to repeat that, um, that verse again, Uh, he didn't come to bring peace. Um, He came to bring division. And that division is necessary even more so now um, in the context that we're in as people are looking for truth. Um, I'll finish by reading another passage in the middle of Matthew chapter 10 and verse uh, 27. Um, This was, again, in that same context that we started with. Uh, He says, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That verse, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the on the housetops. The personal one-on-one relationships we have with Jesus, absolutely, absolutely critical. The things that he speaks to us in prayer that he imparts into our spirit, they are precious and they are powerful. But what it is that he spoke, just as with Nicodemus, what it is that he is speaking to us in these walls here in our own private time, there mu- there will come a time, and the time is really at hand now, where those words will be spoken in the communities that we are in, when they will be shouted from the housetops, and it is going to bring division, because people People are going to start asking questions. They're going to start looking for explanations as to what is this power that I see. And we need to be, we need to be ready spiritually to engage in that because I really do believe that that's what's happening now. I, I w- had the privilege of being at the Tolbert's Life Group on, uh, on Wednesday and you know, Bishop, you had referenced something some time back about hearing people pray in a dimension of prayer you'd never heard them pray in before. I experienced the same thing on Wednesday night there at the Tolberts. I'm listening to people praying, and I'm just, uh, it became evident to me that the bounds of, of the kingdom of God were being expanded in that very moment, and that what was happening there, there was no possibility that it could be contained, not if people continued to yield to what the Lord was doing. So this is imminent, folks. This is coming. This is, we are right on on the very edge of this, and it's time to allow the Lord to to put into our spirit everything we need to to pursue Him 
with confidence and yes, with boldness. And to speak the word of God when those opportunities come. To not be afraid of the division that might occur and simply focus after that division occurs on those that are hungry and those that are, are willing to receive from God. And always to remain sensitive to the Spirit of God for direction on where we should engage and where we should part ways. And again, don't make those determinations with your mind or with your heart. Um, make it with your spirit and under the covering of your spiritual authority. And allow the Lord to direct you in that. Amen? Bishop. Trust me. Hmm? Trust me, stay right here. Yes, yes.